The world is obsessed with how polarized American politics become. I'm more interested in how bipolar America <laughs> has become. We are divided, but we are united at the same time. We are divided by party. Republicans divided from Democrats living in their tribes, their tribes practicing the politics of identity. And increasingly, that politics gets enforced by technology, the technologies of social media, which translate in our interactions into essentially the statement, hey, I'm here and I still hate them. <laughs> that dynamic divides us. But we are also united by belief united by our belief about our government. And that belief that unites us is a deep, deep dissatisfaction with our government. University of Maryland did this extraordinary study in the middle of 2016 and found the highest level of dissatisfaction in the history of polling. But more striking than that was that there was a common reason people saw for their dissatisfaction with their government. And that reason was they don't represent us. Poll after poll, question after question showed exactly this. Corporations and their lobbyists have too much influence. 89% of Americans, 89% of Republicans, 88% of Democrats. Elected officials think more about the interests of their donors than the common good. 89% of Americans, 92% of Democrats, 88% of Republicans. Big campaign donors have too much influence. 91% of Americans believing this, 90% of Republicans, 91% of Democrats. We are united both about the reasons for our failed government and also between the parties that define the political system. Now, one might look at that union and say, is this an opportunity? Can we leverage the union bit to save the union, so to speak? And I think the answer to that is maybe. And it depends on the frame we give to this fight. If the frame is partisan, there's one answer. If the frame is nonpartisan, there's a different answer. My view is if we frame this in a partisan way, we cannot address this problem. But if we find a way to frame it in a nonpartisan, bipartisan, above partisan, I don't know, transpartisan, whatever partisan kind you want, then there is a chance. So if it's framed in a partisan way, then the answer is no. And here's why. There are two reasons. Number one, the nature of the change that we're talking about when we talk about reform. And number two, the nature of us today in the United States. So first, the change. This reform that people are talking about is fundamental, in a sense, constitutional, whether we amend the Constitution or not. Yet fundamental reform in the history of the United States has never been partisan, never except once. And that one time is an example none of us want to repeat now. So the tradition of this kind of reform is cross-partisan. That's number one. And number two, something about us. The fact about us, which we wonks, policy wonks, don't recognize, is that we Americans are not wonks. We are tribes. We are tribes with identities. And the truth is, as shown by social scientists again and again, if we are cued in partisan ways about the issue we're talking about, we will follow our tribe. We will not follow our own reasoning. We will follow our tribe. And if reform gets cued as a democratic idea or a Republican idea, then that means transpartisanship on that is dead. But of course, inevitably, the politics of partisanship will find a way to cue reform either to the left or to the right. And what that means is the opportunity is dead. Now, you might look at that and say, well, uh, this means we're kind of screwed. 
Because policy change for us in the United States right now is the sort of thing that politicians do. And politicians right now in the United States are essentially partisan. There's a business model of politics. It's a business model driven by the politics of the primaries. The best pick in the primaries for the Democrats or Republicans is the most hated pick in the primaries for the other side, for the Democrats and the Republicans. So in the process of identifying the candidates, we identify the candidates that are most partisan for the other side. And this creates this weird pathological tragedy of American politics. There's this pot of gold in the middle, the pot of gold of we are united, not the airline, but we are united in our aim to find a way to fix this government. Yet the politicians, as they stand here and they observe that union, realize the only way they get to the place that they can do something to take advantage of this pot of gold is to play the primary. And when they play the primary game, what that does is mean they are far away from any chance to leverage that pot of gold, and instead they produce this divided and divisive politics that makes many think the project of reform is essentially hopeless. But I think if we can find a way to approach this in a nonpartisan way, then it's maybe not hopeless. And I find inspiration in this nonpartisan idea from the extraordinary movement being led by Reverend Barber, the Moral Mondays movement. And this is a movement that finds a way to express its ideal as principles, not politics. It's a movement that tries to get people to hear. It's not a fight between the right and the left, but between right and wrong. It is a social movement that aims to rise above partisan politics. And that movement, if it stays focused on the common ground that it unites it and is disciplined to keep both political parties within the tent of that common ground, it has a chance to change the very dynamic of the partisan politics that it constrains. So if that's the model, what is our common ground? I believe we should recognize our common ground is captured in the title of the organization that has put together this incredible conference. Representation is our common ground. The United States was born a republic, which by that they meant a representative democracy, which by that means today the democracy must in fact be representative, which means today we must give equal representation to the people within that representative democracy. That was, in fact, Madison's ideal. And then Madison watched that ideal compromised by an extraordinary corruption called the United States Senate. He hated the idea of the Senate because it conflicted with this fundamental principle of equality. But he accepted the exception to the principle he had articulated because it was essential to get the nation born. But despite that exception, the principle of equality expressed now as the principle of one person, one vote, is the ideal we should be fighting for everywhere. And we start by recognizing this republic is not equal in that sense. Do Americans have an equal freedom to vote? No, we have an unequal freedom to vote because of techniques that suppress votes all across this country. Charles Stewart at MIT estimated that 16 million Americans had their votes suppressed in the last election, meaning these people didn't have an equal access to the right to vote. Do we have an equal right to a presidential vote? No, we have an unequal system for presidential vote, not just because of the Electoral College, or not even because of the Electoral College, but instead because of the way states have allocated their electors through a system called winner-take-all, which means that if you happen to be in the minority in your state, a Republican in California or a Democrat in Texas, your vote just never matters. And in the last election, what that means is that 52 million votes 
were counted for the purpose of being thrown away, which means those people were unequal in this system we call a representative democracy. Or think about the equality in the House of Representatives. That, too, is fundamentally unequal, the system of safe seat gerrymandering, which basically means that congressmen pick their voters rather than voters picking their congressmen. What that produces is a dynamic where if you are in the minority in your district, your congressperson will never care about you because the only thing a congressperson cares about is a more extreme member of his or her own party. A Democrat is only worried about a more progressive Democrat, and a Republican is over, over worried about a more conservative Republican because those are the only people who could challenge them effectively in the primary in that safe seat gerrymander district. And so what that means is that 89 million Americans vote and have their vote not matter because their perspective could never count in determining the election. Or finally, and most grotesquely, as funders of elections, are we equal? Obviously, we are not, because we've embraced the idea of private funding of public elections, which means that members of Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time dialing for do for the kids in the room. This is a telephone right here. Um, <laughs> dialing for dollars calling no more than 100,000 people around the country to raise the money they need to get their party back into power, which means those 100,000 have extraordinary power in our political system, and the 139.9 million other voters have unequal power in this political system. Now, this proportion is actually wrong. I'd have to, have to take this one guy and like cut off all but his head to get the proper por proportion to show you just how small this powerful group is. Now, take these and all add them together, and the obvious point, a point that no one could miss, is that this is not equal. We are not equal citizens in this representative democracy, which means they don't represent us. That is our common ground. And the question then is, how can we build on that common ground? And I think we build by identifying projects that could trigger a recognition of the need to establish equality, equality projects, that get people to see the inequality and the need to fight it, to develop an interest first and then outrage, and then use those projects to teach exactly the tie back to equality. That's what my organization, Equal Citizens, is trying to do. We are picking fights that show people how unequal citizens define citizenship in America. Our first project was around the Electoral College. We launched a campaign to make it possible to fund a lawsuit which we will file to challenge winner-take-all in the Electoral College, and we have raised more than enough money to make that lawsuit work. Just this week, we filed a lawsuit to challenge super PACs. This lawsuit challenges super PACs using conservative arguments, arguments the originalists would make to say to the originalists, what would the framers have said about super PACs? And we believe the history will show that the framers would be as outraged as all of us are. And the idea here is then to pick project after project that keeps the fight above partisan, but as we progress to then take those brought into this fight and pivot them back to the core point to get that we have no equal representation in this system. This is just the beginning. And the aim is to build a critical mass of people across the country in this moral movement who insist that we find a way to fix democracy first and who will say to the representatives who ask for their vote, I'm happy to stand with you if you promise me your first act will be to fix democracy first. This is a fight for equality. But it's not the first fight for equality. The first fight for equality, the most important fight for equality in the history of the United States was the fight for 400 years that African Americans have waged for first freedom and then equality in this system. This fight is different from that fight. That fight, the inequality was felt and visible. This inequality 
is invisible. No one notices this inequality as it bears down on them. It's the carbon monoxide of a republic, silent, odorless, tasteless, invisible. And so our challenge is not just to get people to rise up to the injustice they feel every day. Our challenge is to get people to see that this system denies them the basic commitment of a representative democracy. Some people see that more easily than others. Women and minorities in this country get it. They get the idea of inequality. White males like me, it's kind of hard to accept. We've never experienced the life of inequality, but all of us have to recognize that the vast majority live this life of inequality. How do we fight that? With every fight for equality ever, the key has been to trigger dignity, to trigger a recognition of dignity as African Americans did when they fought to achieve equality, as women did as they fought to achieve the right to vote, as we must to achieve the equality we need. So here's the question for us. How long can a self-respecting American, just to keep this a little bit red too, let's say self-respecting red-blooded American, patriots, us, how long can we put up with this indignity? And when will we stand up and demand that it come to an end? Thank you very much.